My name is Olivia. I'm 25 years old. I grew up in a single parent household and we were very poor at that time. Ever since my father passed away when I was young, I had never seen my mother taking a break. She worked day and night in a factory while raising me. Watching my mother's back as she worked, I always wanted to become a member of society as soon as possible and make things easier for her. Even after getting a job, I had a habit of being po in a single parent household and never went out for lunch with my colleagues. Since everyone pays for lunch together, it was lonely to be the only one left in the office. So on sunny days, I decided to have lunch on the rooftop. It was a beautiful day with cherry blossoms dancing in the air. On the rooftop where no one usually comes, there was a co-worker smoking with his back turned, of all days. I thought it was unusual, however, I didn't pay much attention to it and sat on a bench a little distance away, unpacking my lunchbox as usual. Then, suddenly, a gust of wind blew. Oh no, my hat. With the spring wind blowing, my hat was carried away. Here's your hat. Oh, thank you very much. Is that a homemade lunchbox? It looks good. Do you always eat here? Yes, oh, if you'd like. I made too many sandwiches. Would you like one? Well, I didn't mean that, however. It looks delicious, so I guess I'll have one. Please. And please have some omelette too. He was Kevin. My senior who was three years older and worked on the factory line. From then on, almost every day, when I spread out my lunchbox on the rooftop, he came over right away and start picking at my lunchbox. By the time I started bringing enough lunch for to people, he told me that he didn't have parents and how he had been put in a facility when he was young and never met his parents even once before he turned 18 and joined this company. Our circumstances were different, however, we bonded over our impoverished childhoods. It didn't take long for us to become irreplaceable to each other. When I told my mother that I had met someone I wanted to marry, she said, Congratulations, Olivia, I'm so proud of you, and hugged me tightly with her delicate body while crying. One year after we met, we had a small wedding while being blessed by our co-workers. We were truly very happy. Considering Kevin's early morning shifts, we rented a small apartment near the company. That was our start. As I made lunchbox, Kevin brewed coffee next to me. It was our usual morning scene. You know, I've been living alone for so long, so just being able to be with the person I love like this makes me really happy. Kevin murmured with a joyful expression. Me too, Kevin. I'm really happy to be with you in the morning and evening like this. It makes me realize that we're really married. I'm so happy. Thank you for becoming my family, Olivia. Someday, let's live with my mom too. Let's have lots of children and become a big family. A lively big family. That sounds wonderful. Let's become even happier, I said. That day too, he made a lunchbox with his favorite omelet and sent me off as usual with a smile and a wave. Little did I know it would be the last time I saw him like that. Bai had taken a nap until it was time to go to work, and I woke up to the sound of my ringing cell phone. This is police. Are you Kevin's family? Still half asleep, I shook my head and replied. Yes, I'm his wife. Please remain calm and listen. Your husband was just involved in an accident and has been transported to the city hospital. We will give you the address, so please come immediately. It seems that a large truck crashed into Kevin's car while he was stopped at a red light. He died instantly. We had only been married for one month. Why, God? Why did you take Kevin away? Am I not allowed to be happy? Please, I beg you, give Kevin back to me. No, Kevin, please open your eyes. I cried. Kevin's hand that I was holding gradually grew cold. At the hospital, 
My mother quietly hold me as I broke down in tears. She must have felt sorry for me seeing how worn out I was. The owner of a high-priced sushi restaurant in the neighborhood, who is also my mother's childhood friend, took the lead in arranging the funeral for us. After the funeral was over, the owner patted my shoulder and muttered, Olivia, my condolences. I feel bad saying this at a time like this, but there is something I need to tell you, Olivia. The owner began in a calm tone. The truth is, it's about your mother. You see, Olivia, she strongly forbade me from telling you at a time like this. But because I've known your family for a long time, I thought I had to tell you. He said with a troubled expression. Your mother has breast cancer, and it seems to be a bit advanced. I was shocked. Shocked that she had cancer, and shocked that she hadn't told me yet. Come to think of it, she has become thinner. My beloved, beloved mother. I want to give her an easy life but I always end up make her worried. No, please don't let my mother die too. Don't leave me alone. After that, I motivated myself and worked hard. For no reason at all, tears would often stream down my cheeks. However, I have to support my mother. To cover my mother's medical expenses, I asked the owner for a favor and started working part-time at the restaurant for a few hours after my regular job. I worked diligently. Two months had passed since then. On that day, it was Friday night, so the customers never stopped coming. In response to the owner's energetic voice saying, Hey, welcome. I peeked out from the dishwashing area to see the newly arrived customers. The owner's restaurant was a high-priced sushi place frequented by local dignitaries. It was odd to see a boy with a shaved head wearing a tracksuit standing there nervously with a large paper bag in his hands. Olivia, please show the customers to their table for two. I held tea and towels and prompted the boy. Protecting him from the curious gazes in the restaurant, I led him to the table in the farthest corner. Boy, Mike, I'm on the phone right now, so wait a moment before you go in. The owner greeted the boy as if he knew him. After showing them to their table, I immediately returned to the dishwashing area, but I couldn't help but wonder how the boy was doing. Sitting across from the boy, there was a man wearing a jumper similar to a work uniform, with his back facing me. The boy, with red eyes, was stuffing himself with the sushi that the owner was serving. You've been through a lot, kid. You did well. Don't worry, this is the start of a new life for you. The voice that spoke gently to the boy sounded exactly like Kevin's voice. Surprised, I turned back and caught sight of the man. He looked so much like Kevin from behind that I couldn't help but burst into tears. That kid just got out of juvenile detention. It seems that there are a lot of kids who are released but have nowhere to go. Mike, he's one of them. By the way, his name is Mike. Mike has taken it upon himself to actively take in kids like him, probably because he used to be quite the troublemaker himself. But why is he here in such an high-priced restaurant? You're saying something nice, Olivia. Aha! It seems that kids like him have never had sushi like this before. After being released, Mike makes sure they eat their fill of sushi. Oh, by the way, his name is Mike. I couldn't help but be curious about him, the one who looked and sounded so much like Kevin. A few weeks later. Olivia, we received an order for sushi from Mike. Sorry to bother you, but could you deliver it for us? Here's the address. You can go home after you make the delivery today. Excuse me. Your order has been delivered. Here you go. From the back, a man emerged who looked exactly like Kevin. No way, Kevin. I exclaimed in surprise. Mike, as if he had a hunch, asked me a barrage of questions. Do you know Kevin? Where is Kevin now? Who are you? Until I understood that the person in front of me wasn't Kevin, I stood there dumbfounded, unable to hold back my tears. Kevin passed away in an accident two months ago. I'm his wife. That was all I could say. When I calmed down, Mike told me about his relationship with Kevin. 
It turns out that when Kevin was placed in a facility, Mike was there too. Kevin's mother had left him and Mike behind when they were young and went off somewhere with her lover. It seemed like my father was really down after the sudden incident. As he tried to drown his loneliness in alcohol, his life gradually fell into disarray. A concerned neighbor reported the situation, and he ended up being placed in a facility. However, a few years later, it seems my mother came to pick him up. Kevin, who was too young to remember his mother, was extremely shaken and burst into tears. As it was shock for my mother, she took only Mike with her for the time being. After being taken in, Mike was subjected to abuse by the new boyfriend my mother brought home, and he ran away in his mid-teens. He was leading a rough life when the previous company president took him in. Kevin, since I didn't mention having an older brother, I mistook you for Kevin. I'm sorry for surprising you. Your voice and appearance are just as similar. Mike guided me to the living room, and until just before the local Chamber of Commerce meeting started, he listened to me talking about Kevin, my mother, and myself. I see. So you're Kevin's. It's such a coincidence. I wanted to meet Kevin while he was still alive. I wanted to meet him and apologize for leaving him behind. He said, trembling shoulders and wiping his eyes. I've also been quite the troublemaker myself. I've received help from various people to get to where I am now. I couldn't do anything for Kevin. So at least as a family member, I want to support you, Olivia, and assist with your mother's medical expenses. Please, I'm begging you. He said, bowing deeply. Although I should have been the one in the position to ask for help, Unable to resist his passion, I decided to gratefully accept his generous offer. It has been three years since Kevin passed away. Thanks to full financial support for my mother's medical expenses, she has recovered her health, and I can't thank him enough. I thought about what I could do for Mike, so I started cooking meals a few times a week for the boys who live in the construction company dormitory. The appetite of the boys who work physically demanding jobs from early morning never seems running out. Oh, hey. Don't sneak a bite of the fried chicken. I threatened with a ladle, but... Hey, Olivia, Mike is eating the omelet behind your back. When I turned around, Mike had a mouthful. Don't call me Mike. Call me President. Mike only comes here when you're in charge of meals, right? Mike, do you like Olivia? The mischievous boys teased. Well, Olivia's. My brother's wife. It's disrespectful to say something like that to her. She's such a devoted person. Mike blushed and made excuses. For some reason, I found myself blushing as well. The third spring without Kevin has arrived. Kevin, I still love you. That will never change, even now. I don't know what the future holds, but for now, I want to slowly get to know these mischievous boys and Mike, who always embraces us with kindness. Hey, Kevin, can I start liking Mike? This spring breeze carried cherry blossom petals, and just when I thought that, it even took away my hat. That's okay. Huh, Kevin? Olivia, it's all right. I cart your hat. Mike came running towards us. Olivia, can you consider dating me with the intention of getting married? Kevin, thank you for bringing us together with this fate. Please watch over us. I'm Samantha. I'm 32 years old working as a temporary worker. I living with my 10-year-old daughter, Cherry. Cherry doesn't know who her father is. He passed away before she was born. Cherry's father, Jason, and I met in second years of university. I had always dreamed of opening my own cafe, 
So I started working part-time at a coffee shop known for its delicious coffee. Though small, the cozy shop was a haven filled with the smell of coffee. It was the kind of place that made you want to take deep breaths over and over again. Among the regulars, there was a man who always sat at the same spot. It seemed to be like he favored the seat with a good amount of sunlight, spending hours reading a thick book. Sometimes it looked like he was napping. One day as I was learning how to brew coffee, the man moved to sit at the counter and stared at me. Um, can I help you with something? I couldn't help but ask. I like your... Wait, please, don't say something like that all of a sudden. Seeing me panic, Jason burst out laughing. Sorry. I meant the coffee. The feelings of the person making the coffee come right out in the brew. Saying this, he ordered the coffee I'd brewed. I had a mixed feelings of embarrassment and hilarity and lost my tension all at once. Jason seemed to really enjoy talking about coffee. We hit it off and started dating, even dreaming about having our own shop someday. From now on, I would live my life doing what I love with the person I love. I couldn't help but feel thankful for these two happy days. One day, during my senior year of college, I realized I was pregnant. In my confusion, when I told Jason, he held me tightly and said, let's get married right after graduation. We'll start a family and make our dream come true. I was so happy. Everything was going so well. It was almost scary. One day, as I was preparing for graduation, marriage, and childbirth, everything stopped. I was waiting for Jason at the station as usual, we had plans to go shopping for our new home, but he never showed up. He wasn't answered his phone. I heard a commotion in the distance. Hurry, hurry, call an ambulance. A traffic accident. I had a bad feeling and slowly approached the scene. No, it can't be. We're about to start our dream. It's not him, it can't be. Pushing through the crowd, I saw Jason lying on the ground. I couldn't believe it. I kept telling myself it was just a bad dream, trying to wake up from it. But I couldn't stop shaking, even though it was supposed to be a dream. I ran to Jason, my legs shaking uncontrollably. Jason, why did this happen? Jason? I hugged Jason, who was in a stupor, and cried out loud. Samantha, I'll always love you. Please, take this. Jason handed me a paper bag, then lost consciousness and was taken to the hospital. The person who was healthy just yesterday is suddenly gone from this world. I can't believe such a thing could happen, it's beyond my imagination. I just couldn't accept the reality. Every day, I could only think about Jason. His smiling face, his angry face, his sleeping face. Every memory of him tormented me. What saved me from those days of grief was the baby in my belly. I could feel the baby kicking inside my belly. Almost as if she was encouraging me. I wonder if I can be a good mom, always crying like this. Every time I doubted myself, she would respond with a kick. Those interactions slowly helped me regain my strength. I hardly remember the days after losing Jason, it was too painful. The only memories left are those little exchanges with my baby. On the day the cherry blossoms were in full bloom, my baby was born healthy. The cherry trees were full of blooming gloriously outside the window as if they were celebrating. Oh, it's spring already. Looking up, my baby gave me a big, bright smile. Cherry. Her name is Cherry. Samantha, thank you for bringing her into the world. I thought I heard Jason's voice. Jason is happy. Mama can't be crying, right? I hugged Cherry tightly as I said that. To be supported by people, I began my life with Cherry. Of course there were tough times, but her adorable smile healed me day after day. One day, 
a forgotten paper bag caught my eye. What's this? A wave of emotion crashed over me. I had forgotten about it in the shock of the accident, but it was the bag given to me that day. The last gift from Jason. I hesitated for a moment, but I decided to open it. There was a box with tools to grind coffee beans inside the paper bag. And another, smaller box. There were a baby ring for Cherry and another ring, perfectly fitting me. It was same designs and very cute. Jason is always watching over us. It's not just me and Cherry. Jason is always with us. My vision blurred with tears. I will never forget how much I was loved. I made that promise to myself. After that, I started grinding coffee beans every morning. Sometimes, while grinding the beans, I would tell Cherry about the day Jason and I met and the dreams we shared. Sometimes Cherry would gently pat my head when I couldn't help crying. She has grown up to be such a supportive child, and it makes me tear up again. I had some time off from work, so we decided to go on a trip. Our destination was Disneyland, at Cherry's request. We enjoyed ourselves thoroughly, like children. On the second day, while sightseeing in California, someone called out to us from behind. I thought maybe Cherry was being scouted for showbiz and turned around nervously, only to see a man who looked exactly like Jason. Why are you here? I was so surprised I forgot to breathe. What should I do? I can't even blink. Sorry for the surprise. I was wondering if I could ask you something. The more I looked at him, the more he looked like Jason, and I could hardly process what he was saying. It was like he was Jason reincarnated. The place this man was looking for was an elusive cafe owned only to a few and not listed on any map. I was intrigued by this man and decided to help him find this mysterious cafe. A famous cafe, quietly operating in a hard-to-find alley. Finding this cafe is becoming the appeal. Suddenly, I spotted a small sign. Oh, isn't that it? I unintentionally raised my voice and pointed. That's it, no doubt about it. The man was overjoyed and visibly excited. Let me thank you by treating you. I took him up on his offer and we decided to stop by this elusive cafe. The nostalgic sound of the coffee shop door opening. The pleasant aroma of coffee. In addition to antique style tables, there are also leather couches. It's like an oasis in the city. It's been a while since I've been to a coffee shop. Old memories are hazily coming back with this nostalgic feeling. Cherry orders a fruit parfait, and with a delighted yay. Thanks, she starts to eat. I can't wait for the freshly brewed coffee from this mythical coffee shop. Sorry for not introducing myself earlier. My name is Robert. I actually run a cafe. This place is like a mecca for coffee lovers. I came from the countryside just to taste the ultimate cup here. Really? A cafe? That's wonderful. I also dreamed of running a cafe, but I'd completely forgotten about it. I smiled as I recalled my dream. My name is Samantha. This is my daughter Cherry. We're on a trip together. Then the coffee arrived. A noble aroma wafts from the antique cup. I savored the blissful moment, enveloped in the perfect scent. I haven't had a breather like this, always being preoccupied with what's in front of me. As I gently closed my eyes, I felt deeply relaxed, as if my weary heart and body were being told, you've worked hard. The feelings of the person making the coffee come right out in the brew. I was taken aback. I'd heard those words before. When I opened my eyes, I saw Jason looking at me. Jason, did you come to see me? I blurted out. It wasn't impossible to be confused when someone who looked so much like him said the same words. I, I apologize, Robert. You just look so much like her deceased father. I just, I quickly blurted out in my apology. Robert simply nodded, not saying much and watched Cherry and me with kind eyes. He's a little older, 
but it felt as if I was with Jason and Cherry. If only I could stop time right here. It was that comfortable. I couldn't hold back my tears. Cherry patted my head in comfort. Would you like to visit my cafe sometime? Yay. I want to go. Will you make parfaits? Cherry seemed completely open, her eyes sparkling with anticipation. Of course, Cherry. Should we make a parfait together? We agreed to visit Robert's cafe another day, exchange contact information, and part of ways. I was genuinely happy to meet him again. Robert's cafe happened to be in the same county as ours, surrounded by abundant nature. It was like a different world and Cherry was so excited. I want to stay here forever, she exclaimed as she ran around. Robert had prepared a cute apron for Cherry. She brought the parfait they made together to me, pretending to be a waitress. Sorry for the wait. Here's a parfait full of love. Even as she smiled, tears streamed naturally down her face. It seemed as though the dream I had once imagined and given up on was now right before my eyes. Actually, Jason used to frequent this shop. I couldn't hide my surprise. Jason, who was smitten with Robert's coffee, had dreamed of opening a similar cafe. That day when you called out Jason's name, I couldn't believe it. We were said to look like brothers and I had a soft spot for him, like a younger brother. Seeing you, Samantha, I can't help but feel what Jason might have felt. Robert is desperately holding back his tears. Can this really be? Was this place the origin of Jason's dream? Perhaps Jason's feelings brought us together. We also came to love Robert's cafe. We spent peaceful times there every weekend. I often thought how wonderful it would be to always stay here. And then, about six months later. If you and Cherry are okay with it, would you like to help me run the cafe? There was no hesitation for me and Cherry. Thank you. We would be happy too. I couldn't have imagined such a miracle happening. Soon, we moved closer to Robert's cafe. Thank you, Jason. We will fulfill your dream together. In the back of the counter, the coffee grinder sparkled brightly. My father passed away because of a car accident when I was three. After that, my mother, who had always been a stay-at-home mom, struggled to raise me on her own, finding it tough to secure a full-time job and often juggling multiple part-time jobs. Being a single-parent household, we did receive some subsidies from the government, but it was still difficult just to put food on the table. I got a second-hand backpack from a girl who lives in the neighborhood. When I got to middle school, I even got special permission to work as a newspaper deliverer. At 18, I decided to get a vocational skill and borrowed student loans to attend a beauty school. After graduating, I started working as an apprentice at a renowned salon, and by the time five years had passed, I was able to support my mother financially. However, just as things were looking up, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and given just a year to live. Every day after work, I visit the hospital to see my mother and one day, I finally asked her something that had been bothering me. Hey, mom. Why did dad get into that accident? You never told me when I was a child, no matter how many times I asked. When I said that, she stared deeply into my eyes. She had a look of uncertainty on her face. Whenever she spoke about my father, she would always have that expression. It was just... Bad luck, I guess. How's Mike doing? She suddenly changed the subject with a smile. I wanted to know more about my father, but every time I've asked in the past, she never went into details, so I just went with it and talked about my boyfriend. He's good. He said he'd come to visit next Monday. My mother smiled brightly at that. Mike, a fellow hairstylist at the salon where I work, is a gentle and kind-hearted man who my mother really took a liking to. I promise you'll see me in my wedding dress. You have to get better, okay? I told her that with all the determination I had, but she just smiled sadly. Six months later, my mother passed away without ever seeing me as a bride, joining my father. My mother, who had been unconscious, regained her senses for just a moment before she passed away, squeezing my hand and whispering, 
I'm sorry, Lisa, that pearl, your father, for Lisa. What? Mom, what about the pearl? But just then, her consciousness faded, and she never opened her eyes again. Later, while going through her belongings, I found two unprocessed pearls inside a small box. Two simple pearls and adorned, resting inside the box. To this day, I still don't know their significance, and they remain untouched in their box. Six months after my mother passed away, I married Mike. Soon after our marriage, I became pregnant and left my job at the salon to become a stay-at-home mom. We had a baby girl and named her Samantha. Having grown up in a single mother household with its struggles, I didn't want Samantha to go through the same hardships, so I did my best to be a good wife and mother, devoted to protecting our family. At first, Mike was an ideal father, helping out with both household chores and child rearing. However, as Samantha started elementary school, he began coming home late more frequently and often went out alone on weekends. I confronted him several times, but Mike just hung his head and didn't give any answers. Then one day, I received a call from a young woman claiming she was pregnant with Mike's child and asked me to leave him. When I confronted Mike after he returned from work, he initially stayed silent but eventually nodded with a pained expression. At first, it started as something casual. But as time went on, I couldn't resist the affection towards her. I'm truly sorry. Saying this, he suddenly knelt down. She told me she was pregnant, and I said it wasn't possible. But she insisted on keeping the baby, and as we talked, time just flew by. Mike's shoulders trembled as he spoke. I'm so sorry, Lisa. This is all my fault. I promise to pay child support. Can we, can we break up? Tears dripped onto the floor from Mike's eyes. What about Samantha? Isn't Samantha your precious daughter too? Do you think just paying money makes everything okay? All the things I wanted to say raged inside me like a tornado. But seeing Mike apologizing as if every word was a painful effort, I found myself speechless. In the end, we got divorced. Mike consistently transferred child support every month. I had intended to return to my job as a hairstylist, but worried about leaving seven-year-old Samantha alone at night, I took up a part-time job that lasted until the early evening. Initially, after the divorce, Samantha was quite downcast and spoke very little, but by the time she turned 10, she had made more friends and managed to regain her smile. I didn't want Samantha to endure a challenging life. I vowed never to let her struggle for basic needs like I did and planned to return to my hairstylist job to work full-time once Samantha reached middle school. Until then, We'd have to manage with the child support and my part-time income. Just when life with Samantha seemed to stabilize and become more comfortable, I went to the bank one day to withdraw the child support and found that no deposit had been made. In the three years since our separation, this had never happened. Could he have forgotten? Well, it's the first time it's happened. Maybe I should wait and see. With that thought, I didn't contact Mike until the next due date for the transfer. However, the next month, there was still no deposit. I mustered the courage to call Mike. On the third attempt, he answered, and I questioned him about the missing deposit. The truth is, our son was diagnosed with a severe illness, and the medical expenses have been enormous. Hearing Mike's voice for the first time in three years, it was filled with the same pain I remembered from that day. So, the child they had was a boy. I found myself thinking about things unrelated to the child support issue. He's been frail since birth. And now he's scheduled for major surgery. So what? I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from saying that when Mike sincerely apologized. I might not be able to pay child support for a while. I understand I shouldn't be asking you for this, Lisa, but could you give me a bit more time to save our sin's life? How much longer do you mean? I sympathize, but Samantha is my priority. She's your child too, Mike. Don't you care about Samantha? I could sense Mike catching his breath. After a moment of silence, Mike said, Could you maybe consider a job offer? A job? Yeah, a friend of mine is opening a new salon in Chicago. He had invited me initially, but I can't go in my current situation. I'll recommend you instead. I think the pay is quite generous. What do you think? Could this help in the meantime? Hearing this, I couldn't help but raise my voice. Don't patronize me. This is different from what we're talking about. Paying child support is your responsibility. Don't act like you're doing me a favor by offering me a job. And with that, I hung up.
However, Mike never called back. For the next six months, not a dime was deposited. I called Mike multiple times urging him to pay but only received vague responses, and eventually, he stopped picking up my calls altogether. It was at this point that I regretted not formalizing our divorce with proper paperwork. Even during the divorce, I had trusted Mike. I naively believed he would never abandon Samantha, no matter what, but regretting now wouldn't change anything. I increased my part-time hours and desperately searched for a salon willing to hire me as a hairstylist. However, it was challenging to find a place that would hire me full-time due to my long gap in employment. As time went on, life became increasingly tough, and one day Samantha told me we were the only family who hadn't paid for the school field trip. Oh, I'm so sorry, honey. I completely forgot. I promise I'll give it to you by next Monday, okay? I tried to put on a brave face and smiled, but Samantha looked at me anxiously. Mom, are we running out of money? I don't mind if I can't go on the field trip, really. It broke my heart to hear my 10-year-old daughter say that, and I fought back tears. Of course not, sweetie. I genuinely just forgot. Everything will be fine. Saying this, I embraced Samantha. I had no words to apologize for making her feel this way after promising myself she'd never have to go through such hardships. The next day, after ensuring Samantha was off playing with her friends, I took out that pearl from my mother's belongings. Even though I had vowed never to do so, I had finally decided to sell one of my mother's heirlooms to make ends meet. The only valuable thing my financially strapped mother had left was this pearl, and I intended to find out its worth. If it's a genuine pearl, it might cover the cost of Samantha's school field trip. I held the pearl in my hand, almost praying, not really sure where to go. I took it to the shop where my parents had bought their wedding rings years ago. Excuse me, could you check if this pearl is genuine? Upon asking, a young female clerk told me to wait a moment and went into a room at the back. After a short while, an elderly man, likely in his 60s, came out and stood before me. You'd like an appraisal. May I have a look at the item? With a calm voice, he asked, then gently picked up the pearl with gloved hands. I took a seat on a couch, watching as he shined a black light onto the pearl. After a bit, he closely examined the pearl using a specialized magnifying glass. For a moment, he seemed taken aback and glanced at me. I wondered if something was up, but he said nothing and continued his appraisal. How much time had passed? I hadn't realized jewelry appraisals took so long and eventually, he quietly placed the pearl back in its box. This is a genuine pearl. In fact, it's a very valuable South Sea pearl. Even just one of these could fetch a good price. Hearing this, I felt so elated I thought I might jump for joy. However, I cannot purchase it from you. I doubt any shop would be willing to buy it. Wait, why not? I felt like I had been plunged from heaven to hell as I asked the man. I couldn't help but lean in closer. It's because this pearl was specifically purchased just for you. Look here. He handed me a magnifying glass, and I looked where he pointed. On the back of the pearl, something was engraved. Upon closer inspection, I could see the words for one year. I was urged to look at another pearl. On it, just like the previous one, was engraved for two years. You're Oliver's daughter, aren't you? Lisa. Taken aback by the sudden question, I looked up at the man sitting across from me. My name is Kevin and I'm a friend of Oliver. Those pearls you see, Oliver had been buying one each year for your birthday. He said he planned to make a necklace with 20 pearls and gift it to you when you turned 20. Kevin said that with a smile, but to me, it was completely out of the blue. Could these pearls have been bought by a father I can't even recall for my sake? Seeing me speechless, Kevin continued the story. Judging by your reaction, it seems your mother didn't tell you anything. There's a reason Susan didn't share this with you. She struggled a lot too. I'm not sure if an outsider like me should be telling you all this, but you'd want to know the truth, wouldn't you? Would you allow me to stick my nose in? Hearing this, I naturally nodded in agreement. Oliver was over the moon when you were born. He said he wanted to raise you as the happiest girl in the world and consulted me about it. He wanted to give you a gift, so when you became an adult, you'd feel more cherished than anyone else. So, I told him about the European ladies. When they debut as adults, they wear genuine pearl necklaces. 
Oliver then said he'd send a real pearl every birthday. He declared, my daughter will be the world's finest lady. Susan listened with a smile. I could vividly picture the happy faces of my young parents. Then, each pearl had your age engraved on it. On the day you turned three, Oliver was scheduled to come here to pick up the third pearl. That's when he had the car accident. Hearing this, I clearly understood why my mother hadn't told me in detail about my father's accident. He had been on his way to collect a gift for me when it happened. The day of my birthday was also the day my father passed away. The pain and hesitation my mother must have felt about telling me this became painfully clear to me, especially now that I'm a mother myself. Susan believed for a while after Oliver's death that the pearl was the reason he had died. So, there was something she just couldn't bring herself to accept. Saying that, Kevin stood up and disappeared into the back room. After a short while, he returned and placed a single pearl on the table. This is the third pearl Oliver intended to give you on that day. I'm finally able to hand it over to you. Upon hearing this, I took the pearl in my hand and examined it with a magnifying glass. Engraved on it, I could read for three years. Kevin watched me closely and then said, What you choose to do with that pearl is entirely up to you. I simply returned what belongs to you. If I may say just one thing, Oliver only wished for your happiness. Those three pearls are filled with Oliver's hopes, praying for your happiness over 20 years. If you choose to use the pearl for your own joy, I'm certain Oliver would be happy. Kevin said that with a gentle smile, I couldn't hold back my tears. I felt deeply moved by the immense love sent to me from a father whose face I can't even remember. It was this that my mother wanted to tell me in the end. Even after losing her beloved husband, she could have thrown away this pearl in anger, but she didn't. Yet, she couldn't tell me the truth either. I wonder how much turmoil was in my mother's life. Only now did I realize how much my parents loved me. Afterwards, I took the pearl home with care and called Mike. I left a message on his answering machine, saying I wanted to go to Chicago and asking for his help. Thinking of parting with my father's pearl, my own pride seemed insignificant. Even if it meant pleading with my ex-husband, I was determined to work and earn money. Time flew by, and I had been living in Chicago for 13 years. As a hairstylist, I was able to send Samantha to college successfully. When Samantha was in high school, Mike contacted me, asking to resume child support payments, but I declined. The salon owner, introduced to me by Mike, was aware of our situation and had offered me a salary that was, frankly, generous. After all, it was thanks to Mike's introduction. My friends said, You're too soft. But I was happy knowing Mike hadn't forgotten about Samantha and was reaching out. I wish he'd use it for his sick son. If my father were here, he'd probably say, That's what makes you a wonderful lady. Now, at 48, I'm still working with enthusiasm as a hairstylist. Happy birthday, Mom. With those words, Samantha placed a small present on the table. She said she'd treat me to a birthday dinner and had made her reservation at a restaurant for us. Opening the small package on the table, I gasped in surprise. This. I exclaimed as I pulled out a pair of pearl earrings from the box. It has always been my dream to give you these pearls in a wearable form, for Grandpa too. Samantha said with a beaming smile. Under the chandelier light, the milky white pearls shimmered with iridescent hues. Thank you, Samantha. There's nothing that could make me happier. With that said, Samantha cheekily stuck out her tongue and placed her right hand on the table. Not exactly as a trade-off, but can I keep this ring? When I looked at Samantha's hand, a pearl ring was shining on her middle finger. You sure are cheeky. Saying that, I laughed. Of course, you can. It's like passing on happiness through generations. How wonderful. We should thank Grandpa, right? With that, we raised our glasses in a toast. Someday, if Samantha gets married and has children, this pearl will likely be passed down to them and then to their grandchildren, like an endless relay of happiness. One day, my phone suddenly rang. It was a call from Coach, my fiancé David's supervisor. Cheryl, David got in an accident while traveling and he's been taken to the hospital. I rushed to the hospital immediately. There, in the intensive care unit, I saw David connected to numerous tubes. 
David's parents were already there. They told me that David was declared brain dead. Cheryl, thank you for coming. David said if anything happened to him, he wanted to help others. He had registered himself as an organ donor. They are going to transplant his heart. What? Really? It was a shock. My mind couldn't keep up with the situation. David was dead, and his heart was going to belong to someone else. They carried David away to another room. I clung to David, crying out. David. David. Then I woke up. Again. Ever since I lost David in an accident, I've been having this dream over and over. I stared blankly at the picture of the two of us that I have in my room. Then I went down to the living room and had breakfast with my mother, who looked at me with concern. You know, dear, staying at home all the time won't help you feel better. Why don't you go on a trip with your friends once in a while? Huh, you're okay? Since David passed away, I've stopped going out for anything other than work. But I don't even go out to drinks after work anymore. I just head straight home. I'd always remember about David and end up crying in my room. But I knew that no matter how much I cried, David wouldn't come back, but I didn't feel like going out and having fun. My friend Amy was worried about me too. Hey, Cheryl, why don't we go on a trip once in a while? Let's go to the beach. Summer is just around the corner. Let's go shopping for swimsuits. I wasn't in the mood at all. But then I thought, it's not good to keep my mother and my friends from worrying about me all the time. If I force myself to go, I might end up having fun. With that in mind, I decided to go on a trip with Amy. When we arrived at the destination, a really charming wood-style cottage was awaiting us. Wow, it's wonderful. Right. I wanted to see you happy, Cheryl. So I looked for a nice place to stay. Amy and I quickly put on the swimsuits we had just bought together and headed to the beach. Wow, it's so beautiful. We enjoyed swimming in the sea, lounging on swimming ring. The sky was incredibly clear, and the atmosphere was so refreshing. I felt glad that we decided to travel. Let's go out further, Amy suggested and we ventured to a more secluded part of the ocean. Suddenly, clouds appeared in the sky and the surrounding area darkened. Wind started to blow. The weather seems to be turning bad. Should we head back to the shore? I suggested, growing uneasy at this sudden change in weather. Oh, I still want to stay in the sea. Amy responded, continuing to lazily float on her swimming ring. Then, her expression changed as she looked out to the horizon. Wait, there's a really big wave coming. What? As I turned around, a gigantic wave loomed over us, threatening to swallow up everything. This is bad. Let's get out of here. With that, Amy and I desperately began swimming back towards shore. But we were too late, and the wave swallowed us. I couldn't breathe because it was so painful. Then, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was in a hospital room. I could see the worried face of a man peering over me. What happened? You're awake. You almost drowned in the sea. I saved you. What? Really? Thank you so much. And Amy? Oh, Amy's sleeping next to you. She woke up a little while ago. She's fine. The ones who had saved us were the two lifeguards stationed at the beach. Kent was the name of the man who saved me, and his friend, Scott, had saved Amy. Kent was a tan, muscular, handsome-looking man. He didn't look like David, but his strong body reminded me of him. Amy and I regained our strength by the next night. Kent invited us to a barbecue, so we decided to head to a nearby grilling spot for the evening. Amy, Kent, Scott, and I enjoyed drinks while eating deliciously grilled meat. Kent was doing a beautiful job cooking the meat, flipping it precisely. 
The scene made me think of David once again. David had an impressively neat way of grilling meat. He'd sort the meat neatly, flipping them at the right moment. He would always serve it onto my plate. When I tasted the grilled meat, it reminded me of the perfect doughness that David used to cook. And then I noticed, Ken seemed to enjoy skirt steak quite a lot. That too, was just like David. Skirt steak, it's so good. You really have changed your taste in food, haven't you? Yeah, a lot has changed since my surgery. Surgery? I asked, sensing something. Yep. I had surgery last August. I was healthy until then, but I suddenly developed dilated cardiomyopathy and had to have a transplant. Since then, my taste in food has changed. I used to love ribs, but suddenly skirt steak became my favorite. Last August. That was exactly when David donated his organs. Could it be that Kent's heart was actually David's? My heart pounded at the thought, and while he was talking, it seemed like Kent had a habit of touching his chin. It was the exact same way David used to touch his chin. Actually, my ex-boyfriend got in an accident last year and became an organ donor. No kidding. Yeah. Somehow, Kent, you remind me of him. The gestures, the taste in meat. My ex loved skirt steak. Wait, really? Could my heart be from your ex-boyfriend? Our conversation caught the attention of Scott and Amy, who looked shocked. Hold on, is this a destined reunion or something for you too? Right. This is amazing. Cheryl, you always wanted to know who the recipient of the donor was. This is great. I see. Kent seemed to ponder for a moment before he spoke. Could it be that the one who had the accident was Olympic silver medalist, David? Wait, how did you know that? I was surprised. The name of the donor is supposed to be kept secret for privacy reasons. I thought so. I was actually a swimmer on the same team. Really? It turned out that Ken was Davis Jr. and he was a freestyle swimmer. Apparently, he had even won a bronze medal. However, he decided to take a break about four years ago when his swimming records started to not improve. And although he had always been healthy, he suddenly developed a dilated cardiomyopathy. For a while, he lived with an artificial heart because a donor couldn't be found. Kent, who successfully underwent a heart transplant when a donor was finally found, heard about David's death in the accident from his fellow swimmers. He was shocked because he admired David. Then, noticing some changes in himself, he started to wonder if David might have been his donor. And why did you think that? Well, ever since the transplant, I've been having this dream every day where I'm swimming in the Olympics. And in it, I swim really fast and win the gold medal. I used to have dreams about winning gold before, but now it happens way more frequently. What struck me as odd was, even though I've always been a freestyle swimmer, in my dreams I was always swimming butterfly. After that, he tried swimming butterfly and found it easier than freestyle. That made him wonder if the heart he received could have been David's. I see. I was surprised at this coincidence, and I felt happy as if I had met David again after a long time. David is still alive in this man. After that, we set off fireworks and had a fun time. The next day, we went to the sea again for a swim. Don't go too far out. Kent advised us, so this time we didn't venture as far out into the water. While Amy was in the restroom, I walked over to where Kent was sitting, looking at the beach, and sat down beside him. Hey, what made you want to become a lifeguard? Hmm? Well, after I quit being an athlete, Scott introduced me to it, and I thought it could be something interesting to do in my spare time. Plus, 
I'm a good swimmer and I wanted to do something that would benefit others. Are you not going back to being an athlete? No, I had enough. I wondered if he didn't want to discuss this topic because he suddenly fell silent. When Amy returned, I decided to leave the spot. A week passed very quickly, and it was the final day of our trip. Somehow, Amy and Scott seemed to be getting along quite well. I suggested to them, Why don't you two go out for dinner together? Amy was surprised and asked, Really? But wouldn't it be better to spend our last night together as a group? But after a few seconds, she added, Ah, uh, but maybe it'd be better if Cheryl and Ken spend some time alone. No, I don't really. Are you sure? You've been curious about the recipient of David's heart. You finally got to meet him. Why don't you take some time to talk to him alone? Actually, there is something I've been wanting to ask Kent. What? I told Amy what I wanted to ask Kent, and she nodded in understanding. We then decided to have dinner separately. Kent and I dined at a restaurant with a view of the sea. After the meal, Kent suggested, Let's take a walk on the beach. So, we decided to stroll along the beach. The sound of the waves was incredibly soothing. I finally voiced the request I had been thinking about. Hey, Kent, there's something I'd like to ask you. Oh, what is it? Can I listen to your heartbeat? A bow, sure. I gently pressed my ear against Kent's chest and listened. I could hear a strong, steady heartbeat. It was as if I could hear David's heart, strong and healthy. Tears started to well up in my eyes. It's amazing. It's really beating. As I said this through my tears, Kent gently hugged me. I felt like I was in David's arms. Truth is, since the surgery, I've been having two recurring dreams. One about winning the gold medal, and another about you, Cheryl. I always saw an unknown woman and wondered who this beautiful woman was. So, when I saw you at the beach, I was surprised. You were real. I got curious and watched you from a distance, but I never imagined that I would end up saving you. Hearing this, my tears welled up even more. David must have been concerned about never winning the gold and leaving me behind. I can't leave you alone, Cheryl. I want to protect you. With that, Kent hugged me even tighter. After our trip, even though we lived far apart, we kept in touch, met occasionally, and eventually started dating. I thought that Kent might actually want to return to being an athlete, so I encouraged him to do so many times. Finally, Kent decided to quit being a lifeguard and became an athlete again, training hard every day. He changed his swimming style to butterfly and steadily improved his time. There were speculations that it might be tough due to his age and the break he took, but three years after his return, Kent was able to qualify for the Olympics. I went to the venue where Kent was competing. Kent made his entrance, accompanied by the narration echoing through the venue. And then, the competition began. He held on to the third place. But, midway, he began to close in on second place. It became a close competition with the first place, but he managed to overtake at the very last moment. The announcement came that Ken was in first place, and I jumped for joy. The gold medal that both David and Kent had always wanted to win. They finally won it. During the post-competition interview, Kent said, I had given up once, but I'm so glad I decided to try again. I wanted to win not only for myself, but also to fulfill the wishes of David who tragically passed away in an accident. I couldn't stop my tears as I listened. David was still living on inside Kent. His strong heart had kept going and finally won the dream gold medal. David, Kent, congratulations on the gold medal. I whispered tearfully. <laughs>